Hi, my name is Lars Tvede. I am a co-founder of a venture capital fund and I run a hedge fund also. And I'm founder of a company called Supertrans where we make predictions for development of technologies and what they will do for businesses and societies and so on. And uh, some of the things we do include it, that we uh, ask different experts who are working on making the future to make predictions about when things will happen. So in that way, we make a consensus timeline of the, of the world. Um, so we get these uh, different, uh, we can choose any different technology subjects and then we can see what people are predicting will happen and we can study how will that change any specific uh, item. And uh, we also have an app where we can, we can see all the history of human innovation and we can go in and look into the future. And we have AI that picks up uh, news about what will happen in the future and presents it in uh, this uh, dashboard. So we look a lot uh, in these days on what, what will happen with in the energy transition and with the world uh, of the automobiles. Um, so one thing that's very interesting is that KPNG, the consulting house, they, they do uh, frequent surveys where they go out to the top management of different automobile companies, more than a thousand managers from around the world and ask them questions about what they think. And one of the questions I found interesting was when they asked about what would be the drivetrains of the cars in the future and a bit to my surprise, it was the prediction was evenly distrib distributed between the internal combustion engine and battery electric vehicle and the plug-in hybrid and then fuel cells. So I would have thought it would be uh, a lot less fuel cells, but actually they predicted that uh, eight years from now, the fuel cells will be about a quarter of new cars. And then when asked about what will it be in 2040, their, their prediction was almost identical. So clearly hydrogen is uh, going to play a role according to these ex executives. Uh, question though is where will the power come from? If the power less and less comes from uh, gasoline, where will it come from? And this is one of the things that we have studied a lot. And so a good news, I'll start with some good news and then I'll come with some bad news. The good news is that the, the, the price of electricity generated in many different ways has been dropping a lot. Here we have natural gas, we have coal, nuclear has gone up a little bit, but predictions are that it will drop rapidly in the coming decades. Uh, on, uh, onshore wind has dropped a lot, uh, solar terminal power, gas peakers dropped a lot, and offshore uh, solar uh, uh, voltaic and offshore wind has dropped dramatically. Also, there's a kind of more slow for batteries. It's not as radical as more slow for computers, but the battery performance has increased about 7% annually. And uh, as far as we can see from all the predictions from our experts, this will continue for quite a while. Uh, problem is though, that the world energy consumption is on the rise. Here we see the global primary energy consumption in the world. And uh, it goes up and up. Uh, it's about 2.6% uh, annual rise. And uh, renewables, uh, especially solar and wind, today only constitute about 3.3%. And fossil fuels is still uh, growing. So, so here we have overall the, the growth rate of energy consumption in the world is 2.6%. Um, and there's a lot of predictions right now. Um, uh, that we, we will try to completely decarbonize the economy by 2050. Uh, and, and some of them uh, uh, are about that it will all be renewable. And we talk a lot with geologists, with uh, technology experts and so on. And as far as we can see, this is completely unrealistic. Um, there is a scientist called Smeal, who Bill Gates is a big fan of, and he wrote a very interesting book about energy transitions. And he looked at from the time where a new energy form has what you call a product market fix uh, or fit, uh, which is when it constitutes 5% of global energy consumption, what happens with it the next 50 years? So for coal, within the following 50 years, it went up to, to constituting 40% of the world energy consumption. Crude oil went up to 30%, natural gas up, went up to 20%. And when we look at modern renewables, 
I did say that solar and wind was like 3.3%, but you can add biofuel and, and hydrogen or, or dams. So, so uh, all in all, that's 13.2%. So if all should be renewable, um, then we should have this very, very steep takeoff uh, rate. And for many reasons I will come into, I think this is completely unrealistic. We should rather probably expect a, a, a curve that is similar to what we saw for crude oil. And that means that there's a massive gap of energy that needs to be supplied, which cannot be supplied with renewables. One of the problems, and here comes the bad news, one of the problems with renewables is that it takes a lot of space. So here we see space per watt, watt produced. And so for traditional energy, which, which is fossil fuel and nuclear, for instance, you need very little space, but for renewable, you need a lot of space. And even, I mean, the most extreme calculations is that if you compare mini reactors or gas burners to uh, wind, uh, then you need uh, up to uh, thousands of times as much, as much space. So there's a problem in space. How much do we want to industrialize nature? And there's another problem, which is, um, the minerals use the minerals is basically metals. Uh, uh, so if you take natural gas, coal, and nuclear, doesn't use that much metals. But if you take so solar, photovoltaic, onshore wind, and offshore wind, you need a lot. So for instance, offshore wind needs about 15 times as much metal per uh, energy unit produced as natural gas. So that puts a demand of our supply of metals. Similar when we look at the conventional car versus the electric car, on average, the electric car is, is, uses about seven times as much metals. Um, that's the reason why they're more heavy. So there is a challenge here. Um, decarbonizing means metallizing, as people sometimes say in the industry. And uh, right now, we can see that uh, if we take three different metals, so aluminum, copper, and nickel, um, the green demand for this is, is around, you know, six, seven, eight percent of the global demand, but it's shooting up very quickly and will really start to impact the demand for, for metals in a major way. And the problem is that right now all the, the metals are in deficit. That means that we are reducing our inventories. We are, we are using more than we're taking out of the ground. And uh, there are some predictions, for instance, from Goldman Sachs that we will have completely de depleted visible inventories by the end of the year for some of these metals. Here's a, another demand or, or demand supply curve predicted for copper, which shows that it looks like by 2030 or 2029, we shall have an annual deficit of about 8 million tons of copper. So problem is that whereas we, we don't have a geological shortage of any of these things, but it takes a long time to uh, open up uh, new mines Brownfield projects to extend existing mines, mines take two years and for aluminum take three, uh, uh, for aluminum and three years, three to four years for copper. But uh, new greenfield uh, projects can take as long as four years for aluminum and eight years for copper after approvals. So if for copper, for instance, if you factor in approvals on average, it takes 15 years from you, you decide to open a mine until you actually deliver copper to the market. So there's a shortage. So here's a quote. Today, the world consumes 30 million tons of copper per year. And by the year 2050, following this trajectory, we've got to produce 60 million tons of copper per year. If you look at the historical past 10 years, we've only added 500,000 tons per year. Do we have the projects? I don't think so. I think it will be extremely difficult. This was said by Ivan Glasenberg, the CEO of Glencore, which is one of the two biggest mining companies in the world and a leader in copper. And so if you look at both the, the energy comp company and the mining companies, there has been underinvestment uh, for the last many years. Uh, there was until, I would say until 2014, they were investing enough to meet demand. But after 2014, for a number of different reasons, they have invested far too little. And so they should have followed this, uh, this uh, curve that I've drawn in, but they have not. So the, the severe, under investments in the resources economy worldwide. Here's another quote. Today, the data shows a looming mismatch between the world's ambitions and the availability of critical missiles that are essential to realize those ambitions. 
And this is from the CEO of in International Energy Agency. So here we hear from the energy sector also that there is a shortage of metal to provide this all this electric power. Then you can say, okay, regarding metals, what about recycling? But the fact is, the actual fact is that right now we are only capable of recycling about 18% of the metal. So this is not something that really solves the problem. That brings us to the hydrogen economy because the hydrogen economy can require either a lot less uh, metals or somewhat less, less missiles. It's a lot less if it's powered by nuclear, for instance. It's somewhat less if it's powered by solar and wind. So the hydrogen economy, which apparently many executives from the car industry are very bullish about, uh, will roll out gradually. We have to get the, the uh, production prices down, probably below $1 per kilo before it really takes off commercially. Um, but here is a, a prediction, and this is one among many, uh, and uh, not necessarily the final truth, but this is by Arthur D. Little. And we can see that the, the first sectors where they expect that this will be commercially viable uh, is in emergency power and forklift trucks, then buses and trains, um, and then a bit later in light, light vans and passenger cars. So this is around 2030. So interesting that the, uh, the automobile executives uh, predict that a quarter of all cars will be fuel cells uh, by, uh, by 2030. This is exactly the point where Arthur D. Little predict that they will make commercial sense. But if we look at, a, if we take really a helicopter view on the, the transition to hydrogen, there's an interesting phenomenon. Um, so we have had since uh, 1770, a transition where we've gone for, uh, from having in our energy mix, a lot of carbon and, and not much hydrogen to having more and more hydrogen and less and less carbon. So in 1770, we had 90% carbon. This was, uh, this was uh, wood basically. Uh, and then the midpoint was reached in 1935. And uh, if we uh, continue on this exponential curve, uh, by 2100, we should have a 90% hydrogen economy. Having said that, we should not mix things up because uh, just to explain what is meant by the graph we saw, saw before, if you, you, if you provide power with coal, um, the material coal, then you will have at an atomic level, a lot of coal and a little bit of hydrogen. Of course, coal doesn't provide power. It's just a matrix, chemical matrix that fixes the hydrogen and it's the hydrogen reaction with oxygen that gives us the power. The power. Oil has less coal, gas has a lot less coal. So moving from coal to oil to gas uh, reduces the CO2 emissions a lot. Uh, if we take the last step to hydrogen, of course, there's no coal at all. So problem is that the first three are energy resources. Number four, the hydrogen is really an uh, energy storage. So we need some other energy to isolate uh, this hydrogen and use it. And this is where I think eventually in the end game, nuclear energy will be very important. I spoke with one geologist who said, green transition without nuclear energy is magical thinking. You cannot just dream of solar power and windmill and then everything will become it. That's not going to work. So just for perspective, if we look at how many reserves we have of different resources, the fossil area is, is uh, close to peaking. It has not peaked yet, but it will probably all in all last 300 years. And I've plotted this into this graph here. The graph goes up to 120 million years. In China, there's an experimental reactor with thorium. So this is nuclear fission. And our resources of that is about 100 million years of global supply. So much, much bigger. So that could be a part of the tradition that will go on. But now I change the scale to billions of years. Uh, and that is because I'm going to show some really big numbers. So on this scale, we cannot even see the 300 years of fossil fuel. We can see the 100,000 years of, of thorium, but, uh, nuclear fusion uh, is essentially completely uh, limitless. And this is the merger of deuterium and tritium in a fusion reaction. And this is a part of the process we see when we study 
what all our experts are predicting. We look at every year and see what are the main breakthroughs they predict. And really interesting is that there's actually quite a lot who, who predict that nuclear fusion is very close to breaking through. So I have this funny picture here. So the, there's a person in a bathtub. Now assume that the, the water in this bathtub is pure tap water, then that tap water, and normal tap water in any household will include a little bit of heavy water, and that's deuterium. You take the deuterium that is naturally in that tap water in one bathtub, and then you take two uh, lithium batteries out of your notebook computer and convert them to tritium, then you have enough raw materials to power your entire wealthy life for a whole year for everything, transport, heating, cooling, whatever, because you can do nuclear fusion. Of course, nuclear fusion has been very hard to implement, but uh, if we look at the Morse law of nuclear fusion, it's actually been developing very rapidly, it started in, in late 15, 1950s, and then you have various different technologies that have been implemented, all of them going through very rapid exponential performance growth. So you have these uh, jumps on the uh, vertical line here, from 10 to the, the to the 15s to 10 to the 17s is a factor of 100. So many of them during the time where they were they were pursued imp improved thousands of times in performance. So here we plotted in all the different technologies that have been used, and we have an overall trend line of the kind of Moore's law of nuclear fusion. Then we have at the top of this graph we have 2x performance, which means you get twice as much energy out as you put in. This has been achieved for a brief while many times. 10x is the next, and then you have uh, unlimited where the, the reactor just runs and powers itself. So in France, there's an international experimental reactor uh, expected to go live, which will be up around close to where it can become commercial around 2040. A much later project is Spark, which is a joint venture with Princeton University. But there are 24 different reactors going on, and the progress is amazing. And it's it's there's a tendency that the, the latest started projects actually are progressing and overtaking the, the later ones. This is a company called First Life Fusion, where they drop a little pellet of plexiglass with a bubble that contains a tiny amount of deuterium and tritium, and then they shoot it with a ray gun. That triggers the nuclear fusion. It's amazingly efficient. And one, one pellet, one shot will power a family, uh, a whole household for everything they need for four years. So a tiny reactor could power a city of four people by doing two shots per minute. So these are the kind of very, very compact technologies that are coming up. So we are going into a commodity squeeze. We have entered a commodity squeeze right now and will probably last five to 15 years. But after that, we will have amazing abundance. And somewhere along the curve, also carbon uh, capturing and sequestering will probably become competitive so that we can restart uh, oil and gas and, and coal if we have closed it down. A lesson from this is that energy transition takes a lot of time. I showed you this graph before. I'll show you show it to you again. What it really means, what the message in, in this means is that we need a mix. So when the car uh, executive said that we will have a mix, I think that that's not only a, des a desirable solution, but it is also a necessary solution. If we are too one-sided in anything, we will run out into completely impossible constraints. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Lastwater. Thank you for your sharing. And we have three more questions to consult you. The first question is, in your new book, Super Trends, you have suggested a trend that the world's energy supply is undergoing an exponential shift from carbon to hydrogen. What are the main industries affected by this trend? And what is the impact on the daily lives of normal people? I, I, I think what will happen is that we, as I said, we're going through a, a commodity squeeze uh, and it's not going to go very, very quickly. So we've seen commodity prices go up the last uh, quarters and month um, and this will not disappear. So we will have uh, expensive uh, lifestyles in some, in some respects for a period. 
but we should know that what comes after that is amazing abundance. Um, so people will feel hardship, but then afterwards, uh, a lot of, of problems and bottlenecks that we have will disappear. Thank you for your answer. The next question we want to ask you is, Tesla stock price has continued to shake sharply so far this year. What do you think are the reasons behind this on an industrial development level? From an investment perspective, how do you judge the future development of the new energy vehicle sector? Do you own shares of Tesla or other new energy vehicle companies? So uh, I, I am quite invested in in uh, what I be, in the themes that I believe in here. From a, a purely investor point of view, for instance, if you look at windmill companies, even though they have rapidly rising demand, um, they are struggling to make money on average on the globe. Uh, and that is because there's very hard competition between them. Uh, but if you look at the valuation and the demand curves for uh, energy and mining companies, um, they are making a lot of money. They generate a lot of cash flow. Uh, if I take, now I mentioned uh, Glencore earlier. Um, I saw a report from Goldman Sachs that said that Glencore would return 70% of its market cap to the shareholders within three years. Um, so basically you invest $100 in Glencore, you get $70 back in, form, in the form of uh, dividends and, and share buybacks in three years, and you still own the shares. So I think from an investor point of view, uh, you need to invest where there's a bottleneck, and the bottlenecks are in the supply of the necessary commodities. This is what I focus on. Okay, thank you for your answer. And the next question is, we all know you are very familiar with global energy transition. And the question is, what investment opportunities are presented by this transition? And what are the investment priorities of international mainstream capital in this field? You see that, so the priorities of many investors have been uh, to be envir environmentally uh, responsible. And here, I, th I think that a, a lot of pension funds, for instance, and other institutional investors, uh, they put in these investment filters in what they can investment, invest in and what they cannot invest in. And also, there's a big demand from consumers uh, in companies that are responsible. This is what has created this commodity squeeze. Uh, so I showed earlier this graph that shows there's been massive underinvestments in the fossil fuel industry. There's been similar massive underinvestments in the mining industry. And there are lots of people who like windmills, but they don't like mines. And they, so they, they want to have more windmills and less mining. And that's not possible. So um, from a purely economic perspective, what pays off here is to be contrarian and, and say, well, we do need this, and um, and we we need it uh, from a, uh, some of it, uh, possibly uh, only for a limited uh, time, but it could be that if we get carbon capture uh, and sequestering cheap enough, that actually will continue to uh, to uh, produce oil, gas, and coal uh, in the distant future also. So it is to be contrary and not go with the flow, but, but, but compare what people think with the actual realities in the marketplace and then see that there's, there's something completely wrong.